Thank, thank you all for coming. I'm Rick Carlson. I'm the director of the Department of Terrestrial Magnetism. Uh, it's quite a mouthful, but it's one of the two departments here on, on the campus on Broad Branch Road. We thank you all for coming out on this uh, rather summery fall evening. This is the first of our uh, fall uh, series of neighborhood lectures. We have four to five of these a year. We're having five this year. We'll have three in the spring and, and uh, one more after this, uh, this fall. Uh, it's my pleasure uh, to introduce Dr. Laura Wagner, who's tonight's speaker. Laura uh, is a seismologist. She'll be telling you uh, a variety of interesting aspects of the Earth's interior tonight and how you actually image it the way that you do uh, imaging uh, the inside of human bodies with the ultrasound, for example. Uh, Laura got her degree at Columbia University and then uh, moved on to Arizona State University for a PhD. We were lucky enough to get her here as a postdoc uh, uh, some time ago, and then she went from, from our uh, place to uh, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where she became a professor. She's uh, won a variety of awards. She's the Walter Wheeler Faculty Teaching Award at UNC, uh, and she's also the uh, IRIS, which is the Incorporated Research Institutions for Seismology, in case you didn't know what IRIS stood for. Uh, uh, so Seismological Society of America Distinguished Lecture, and I think you'll see why she got this award uh, with her, her speech tonight. So I won't take any more of your time. Uh, Laura will be talking to us tonight about pointing the telescope down, seismo vision into the Earth. Well, thank you all for coming tonight. There's a lot of people here. This is great. Uh, I see some familiar faces, some new ones. It's great to have you all here. Um, so as Rick said, I've, I've been back now uh, for a couple of years here in D.C. And uh, being a seismologist in D.C. is a lot of fun. You tend to get a lot of blank stares when you tell people what you do for a living. And, you know, <laughs> that, that's, that's fair. Um, there's a lot of misconceptions in popular culture about what it is that seismologists do on a day-to-day -day basis for work. Um, and, uh, you know, to be fair, a lot of seismologists do spend um, their time studying earthquakes and earthquake-related hazards, trying to gauge what the likelihood and hazards are to specific communities of these events, um, and that's very important work. But for a lot of seismologists, uh, myself included, what we do uh, is a little bit more akin to something like this. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this cinematic masterpiece. Uh, but for, for those of you who maybe haven't seen it yet, and I encourage you to do so if you haven't, um, the premise is that the horse stops spinning and all of a sudden everybody who has a pacemaker falls to the floor and birds are flying into windows and it's a disaster. So they build a ship made of this material called unobtainium and they <laughs> sail it into the planet's interior, seeing all kinds of amazing stuff along the way, and then they're able to like kickstart the core. It's, it's a brilliant movie, yeah, you, you have to see it. But it's one, it's one of my favorites. Um, but, but since we, we haven't quite gotten around to building this unobtainium shit just yet, uh, we, we have to be a little bit more clever about how we go about taking a sneak peek into, um, into the planet's interior. Uh, so how do, we, how do we go about doing that, and, and why bother? It's clearly going to be a lot of effort, ship or no. Um, so what is it that we want to know? And the hazards aspect is an obvious one. We clearly want to understand things like earthquakes and volcanoes. Um, but there's perhaps a more fundamental underlying reason to understand um, how a planet uh, like Earth comes to be. And so uh, some of you may have seen this press release, this came out this past August, uh, our very own um, um, Bob Butler and, and others here at, uh, at DTM recently discovered a planet surrounding our nearest star. And this planet is about the right size and about the right distance from this star um, to support life. That's fascinating. It's not as the universe goes that far away. But it takes more than just the right temperature to support life. You have to have water, you have to have an atmosphere, you have to have a magnetic field. And to have those things, your planet needs to be moving internally. And so in some metaphorical sense, the planet has to be alive if you want that planet to support life. 
So what do we mean by, what do I mean by planet being alive? I'm not suggesting that the Earth is about to reproduce, but in a very real sense, the Earth is, um, is evolving, right? So it is, um, it's been evolving since it first formed about four and a half billion years ago. Uh, it formed by the accretion of a bunch of smaller bodies smashing together. Those collisions create tremendous heat, and so we have this molten body um, that then slowly begins to cool. But even as it's still growing, it starts to evolve, it starts to differentiate, and you start to form a, uh, an inner center to it that's made of the more dense materials like iron, a core, right? And then uh, over the course of time, this, this differentiation, this evolution continues. The more dense materials sinking to the center, the lighter materials like silica, and most rocks are made of, rising towards the surface. And then this continues through a series of procedures, dot, 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 fill in the blanks, which is what we're working on, till you end up with the planet that we have today, where you have a, a, a solid inner core uh, made of iron, a liquid outer core, a solid but deformable mantle. So think silly putty. It, it will move, but it's a solid. Uh, and then this very crispy thin outer shell that's broken into plates and is kind of moving around. Um, there are a lot of reasons uh, to study this, uh, but part of it is that what makes the planet unique among all the rocky planets in our solar system is that all of these parts are still moving, right? The inner core is growing on the order of about a millimeter per year. Um, as the Earth continues to cool, it loses that heat of formation, uh, and so the iron increases <coughs> the center. The outer core is spinning probably in these sort of vertical spirals that generates our Earth's magnetic field that we depend upon. And then the Earth's mantle is convecting, bringing that heat from the center out towards the surface. Uh, we're still studying what we actually mean by convecting and what the scales of this convection might be, but part of that whole convection system is uh, plate tectonics, which many of you have probably heard of. Uh, and with plate tectonics, what happens is the mantle rises towards the surface of the upward leg of this convection cell, brings this material towards the surface, and when it hits the surface, it forms new plate. So it creates new parts of this crispy outer shell. And if you're going to create new plate and the planet's not growing, you have to destroy an old plate somewhere else. And so that's the downgoing side of this convection cell. That's what we call a subduction zone. So that's where this old stuff is returned back deep into the planetary interior. And throughout this process, you continue to evolve planet Earth. So what we'd really like to do is to understand this process better by taking a sneak peek inside. Um, and so how do you go about doing that? Well, if we, s if we stick with this analogy of the Earth being a living thing, um, so how do you take a look inside a living thing? If you, if you don't want to do surgery, well, you, you, you take an x-ray, right? And an x-ray is really pretty simple. So you, you, you have x-rays. X-rays are waves. They're electromagnetic waves. And if you send them through a body, some of those waves are either blocked or absorbed or reflected. Uh, by more dense materials like bone. Um, and so if you capture the rays that make it all the way through, the rays that make it through expose a photographic plate on the back end and the exposed parts turn black. And the parts that don't get any x-rays because everything was blocked along the way, those stay clear so they show up as white when you shine a light through it. Uh, and the more dense the material is, the brighter this looks because the fewer x-rays actually made it through. Now, x-rays are great, um, but the big problem is that if you have one really dense thing along the way, uh, and there's something else either directly in front or directly behind it, you're not going to see it very well, right? Because it gets obscured by that image. So uh, what you really want is a 3D image, right? And we have those in medical imaging, right? We're all familiar with those. We call those CAT scans. CAT stands for computerized axial tomography, in case you ever wanted to know. Um, and the idea there is really pretty simple. The idea is that if you take enough 2D images from enough different angles, you can map out what it looks like in 3D. So in this case here, you have a woman, she's holding a pineapple and a banana. And if you shine a light on her from the front, so if you took like an x-ray from the front, then the x-ray image would look like this shadow on this back wall here, right? So in that case, you see the banana, but you don't see the pineapple because her body's in the way. 
rotate that 90 degrees though, you take a shot, side on shot, and now you see the pineapple, but you don't see the banana. But if you do this from enough different directions, right, then eventually you can kind of get map out in full 3D what you're seeing. So when you go into that donut for the CAT scan, this is basically what's happening, right? Is this thing is spinning around you and shooting x-rays through you in every direction, and the, the plate behind it kind of moves with it, and eventually they map that out all the way. So the axial part, in case you were curious, was that she's the axis. So this person here is at the axis, and everything is sort of spinning around this central focus. Um, the tomography comes from the idea that actually seeing things in 3D can be quite tricky. Right? So 3D graphics are always kind of com complicated. So we can image 3D things by putting, by putting slices through them and looking at one slice after another. So what you're seeing here are progressively deeper slices through this person's abdomen. Uh, so you kind of can see their kidneys come and go. So these are, that's the tomography part of this. So the T just means, tomos means slice in Greek. So it's imaging by slices. So that's what the T has. Um, so, you know, this sounds great and uh, it's like something we would like to do. Um, except, of course, we can't put the earth into a CAT scan machine and x-rays don't actually go through rocks. So. Um, we need a wave that will go through rocks and then a wave to image those. So we need the, the x-ray machine and the wave generator and then we also need the receiving plate from the far end. Creating a seismic wave is not as hard as it sounds. Nominally, if I stomp on the ground, that generates a seismic wave. It's not going to go very far, but you can do that. And so depending on what it is that you're trying to image, you can use these things. So this is, for example, a seismic source we call an accelerated weight drop. It's just what it sounds like. You fire something into the ground, um, and that generates seismic waves. And those waves ripple out in all directions, just like if you throw a rock into a pond. Uh, and they bounce off of different structures that have different properties, just kind of like x-ray waves will bounce off of bone. And then if you put a bunch of receivers at the surface, you can kind of try and map out what those structures are at depth. The problem with things like weight drops or other sources, or even large explosives, um, traditional explosives anyway, they're not big enough to go very far. The biggest blasts that traditionally get set off doing this type of study really only get you about a half a percent of the radius into the Earth. So if you want to see the other 99 and a half percent of the Earth's sort of depth, you're going to need to find yourself a bigger source. And since we eliminated nuclear testing some time ago. Um, <coughs> yeah. uh, we have to go with earthquakes. So the biggest nuclear bomb, by the way, was about the size of a magnitude 7 earthquake. Those actually made pretty interesting sources for seismic imaging. Very simple, very easy to handle, great. Um, but, you know, for the betterment of man, we'll stick with earthquakes. Those earthquakes, if it's bigger than about a 6, we can record those earthquakes with pretty high fidelity. Anywhere on the planet, we have a seismometer. Uh, and so these waves, these are sort of, a, this is an image of where all these waves might go through the entire planet, all the way straight out the other side. Uh, and so, you know, that's great. So problem solved. Let's just cover the planet in seismometers, and we've got all these earthquakes, and then, you know, voila, we'll know everything about what the planetary's interior structure is. Yeah, um, so the problem with earthquakes, though, is that we don't actually get to decide where they happen, Oklahoma notwithstanding. So, uh, <laughs> And for the most part, earthquakes, and certainly the big ones that we would want for this type of imaging, happen at the edges of those plates in plate tectonics, right? So they happen where one plate is grinding past the other. There are exceptions. For those of you who remember the earthquake we had here in 2011 in Virginia, the one that broke the, the, the National Cathedral and the Washington one. Yeah, that one. Yeah, so, 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 so that was a little unfortunate, yeah. Um, so there are, there are exceptions that are, that are humbling and they're good for job security. But um, uh, for the most part, these earthquakes happen at plate boundaries. So um, we don't exactly get that nice uniform distribution of x-rays that you would get in a CAT scan, right? Because it's pretty patchy. Most of these places don't have purple dots on them. The other thing that is a problem is that you might notice that most of this map is blue. 71% of the Earth's surface is covered <coughs> in oceans. And I think you can probably imagine that collecting seismic data from the bottom of the ocean is substantially trickier, mm -hmm. not impossible, substantially trickier and more expensive 
and collecting seismic data on land. So by and large, there's a lot less of that going around. There's also a lot more continents in the northern hemisphere than the southern hemisphere. So even at its best, kind of an uneven distribution. But we seismologists, we are a tough bunch. We do what we can with what we have. Uh, and so beginning in the, actually in the early 60s, we did, developed what was originally called the Worldwide Standard Seismographic Network, the WWSSN. We've now shortened that to the GSN. It's much, it's much slicker. But the WWSSN, so this was 1961 that that was developed. Plate tectonics wasn't even beginning to begin, become an accepted theory until the mid-60s. The reason for the original WWSSN, anybody want to guess? was to locate nuclear explosions, right? This is the height of the Cold War. We wanted to know who was blowing up what, how big, and where, right? So when tests went underground, seismology really came into its own. Nowadays, we still have the Global Seismic Network does still serve that purpose, and we do still get funding from DOE and DOD for that. But uh, by and large, mostly now, this is um, used for the types of seismic imaging that I will tell you about today. Um, you can see that there are a great number of stations that are all over the place. These are permanent and fairly elaborate installations. So they tend to be built either in, uh, right into cliff walls or in deep mine shafts where the temperature fluctuations because of sunrise and sunset and seasons is kept to a minimum and noise from things like traffic are greatly reduced. So they're like way deep in these things. They'll have like a pier that's isolated from the structure around it. So if the building shakes, the pier doesn't, unless the ground underneath it does as well. So all kinds of measures. The actual <coughs> sensors look something like this. So these three things here together make one sensor. There are three components. One records ground motion up, down. One records ground motion north, south. And the other records ground motion east, west. You put those three together, and you can map out exactly how the ground is moving. These are vacuum sealed chambers that are bolted to this pier. This guy, little guy back here, I'm gonna talk about more later. So just remember him, that's the, called the STS-2. These are the STS-1. The STS-1, by far the best seismometer that's ever existed, but they stopped making it in the late 90s. They're made by a Swiss, well, it's basically a watchmaker, who uh, I guess at some point couldn't get the right alloy anymore and just decided he was done making STS-1s. We have not yet received its equal, so we take really good care of the ones that we have. Um, okay, so these are the types of images then that we can come up with using all those earthquakes and all those stations. Um, they're just a couple of examples, and bear with me here. Unlike with X-rays, where there was you know there was, it was white or black, we we tend to prefer much more colorful palettes, um, and what we actually image is not did the x-ray make it through at all? The seismic waves will make it through everything. What we map out is how fast do these seismic waves travel through different rocks. So blue means that they, that particular part in the model, the seismic waves travel really fast through there. And red means the seismic waves travel really slowly through there. Doesn't really matter. Nobody actually cares what seismic wave speeds are in the deep earth interior. What we care is what it tells us. And that's a long story and about a symposium's worth of talks on its own. But here's the sort of crib sheet to that, is if it's blue, it's probably cold and rigid. And if it's red, it's not rigid. And it's probably not rigid either because it's hot and or partially melted and or it has water in it. Okay, so that's sort of your crib sheet there. And so what you see here, so this cross section here goes through the earth. Here's South America, and the cross-section goes right through there, so dead center is sort of right in Peru. And we know that this plate here is going down under South America, and that's what this blue streak here. That is the plate that was originally lying under the Pacific Ocean, and is now extending all the way from the surface all the way down to the core mantle boundary. That's 2,800 kilometers and change below our feet. On the other end, this cross section here goes sort of through the Pacific Ocean, ending up kind of in Texas. And dead center here, this is Pitcairn Island. Pitcairn Island is a little bit like Hawaii. It's a hot spot track. And we've long wondered what exactly hot spots were. They're sort of part of the original story of plate tectonics on how you get island chains. But 
we sort of wondered, did they, do they really come from the core mantle boundary? And it seems like in some places they do, in some places they don't, but when you see images like this, it seems pretty clear that they probably do, at least in some cases. Um, now if you compare these two images to my sort of 101 diagram here, you can see the resemblance. Um, and that kind of works both ways. There was the 101 idea of what, what's the theory behind plate tectonics. And then as we develop these images, we refine exactly, well, what is the geometry of a plate when it goes down? How far does it go? Does it stall along the way? Where do these upwellings come from and from how deep? Um, of course, it, it's a pretty blurry streak of blue, right? The, the geochemists typically laugh at us for our color scale, so we'll call that, since we don't exactly know what it is, they call it blueite. So it's the name of a rock, blueite and redite. So it's this streak of blueite here coming down, sort of kind of, uh, you kind of see it squint. Um, it'd be nice if we could do better. And so there's this question of, well, okay, maybe we don't have to do the whole planet at once, right? What if we just focus on a chunk of it where there is a continent where we can do some imaging? Maybe there's some convenient earthquakes. Um, what if we what if we just zoom in on like a big area, like a whole continent? Could we could we see something uh, a little bit more clearly? And um, that's a great idea. It brings with it its own challenges, though, and that that's sort of an important part that I want to get across um, today in this talk, which is that if you're doing continent scale imaging instead of whole scale whole Earth imaging, you have a problem because all of your stations are on one side, right? And so it's a little bit like with our CAT scan one, it's a little bit as if your, your receiving plate is now stuck. It doesn't move. You may be getting x-rays from all directions, but your plate is fixed in one place, right? So that poses some challenges when it comes to imaging. Um, and so here's sort of a schematic where you have couple of earthquakes here and some stations, and then you want to image out, let's say, this part of the Earth's mantle here. So let's say if we start with this earthquake over here, um, and you imagine, let's say this was, let's go back to our x-ray analogy and say that this generated some waves, and those waves, for some reason, they showed up at this station, they showed up at this station, but they did not show up at this station. What that tells us is that somewhere along this path, something blocked it, right? But where? Where along that path did that get blocked? Well, if we have another earthquake like this one over here, right? And let's say we see, well, where does that show up? Does it show up at all those three stations also? And in this case, maybe it doesn't show up at this station over here, right? It shows up at this one, it shows up at this one, it does not show up at that one. That means that in all likelihood, whatever it is that's blocking it is where these two rays intersect. So you can really only see, you can only image those regions where you have these crossing rays. Because without that, you don't know where this thing's happening. Everything kind of smears out. Um, and so here in this schematic, there are three different places where that happens. But what happens if you have a smaller array? So what if we cut the size of this array by a third? So now it's, now it's only this wide instead of this wide, right? When you do that, you lose those two crossing rays, right? And if you compare, what you're really losing, in addition to just how wide of an area laterally you can see, you're losing depth, right? So, oh, sorry. So the, the wider the aperture, the bigger of an area you're covering in your study, the deeper down you can see, right? So it's a little bit like a telescope. You have a bigger telescope, you can see further away, right, with, a, with some given amount of resolution. Um, so that's a really important principle, and it was sort of one of the guiding principles behind this project here called EarthScope. Uh, EarthScope, it started in 2004, it just sort of, it's now morphed into a second version of itself, but its original version ended last year. Uh, in 2011, it got voted as the most, the number one most epic project by popular science, something we were quite impressed by given that they'd be competing against like CERN and the Hubble telescope and yeah. other things. So, you know, really nice of them. Um, <laughs> but the keystone of EarthScope was this thing called the transportable array. Um, 
There are about 2,100 dots on this map, and seismic stations costing what they do, there's no way you're going to have that many in at the same time. But what Earthscope did was it said, okay, let's buy 400 of these things, and let's leapfrog them across the country. So they started in 2004 over here, in 2005, and installed them along the west coast, and by 2006, they sort of had a good chunk of the westernmost United States covered. And then as soon as any station had run for two years, two years is sort of like a good amount of time to get an average distribution of global earthquakes. So you know you're getting the data that you need. It takes some time for those earthquakes to happen again without the nuclear testing. So um, you take the station that's been running the longest off the back end and you move it to the front end, right? And so they were constantly demobilizing and remobilizing these stations from west to east, and slowly but surely, this thing marched its way across the continent until it got to the east coast in 2013, and the last station was pulled out of the lower 48 uh, last year. So this is a huge aperture array. We've never seen anything like this before for a regional scale deployment, so something that isn't doing the whole planet at once. Um, the station spacing was about 70 kilometers between stations. These things were professionally installed. So they're pretty huge installations, even though they were temp technically called temporary or transportable. These vaults, they're six and a half feet tall. They're three feet in diameter. So they take a backhoe, they dig this enormous hole in the ground, they put this injection molded thing in there, they set it into 2,000 pounds of concrete, uh, and then they have a seismometer in there that they orient with this really fancy compass. Uh, they have a data logger. And then eventually they bury this whole thing under a great big pile of dirt, hook it up to some pretty solid solar panels. They also live stream the data into the data center so that everybody in the world can get that data pretty much immediately. Um, and so all of this together is pretty, pretty elaborate installation. They're not small, as you can see, with cows, cows for scale. The fence is important. Cows like to chew on the tables. Um, so they did this over 2,000 times. So this was a pretty epic endeavor, indeed. Right? Uh, but it paid off. The images that we got compared to what you would get out of the Global Se Seismic Network were impressive. And again, I could have a whole symposium showing the results of Earthscope science. And in fact, people have done stuff like that. But I wanted to show you one picture in particular that came out a bit fuzzy. This is an image here of one of those blue-eyed streaks that we have. This is a down-going plate. What's interesting about this plate is that there's only a tiny little bit of it left of the surface. There's a tiny corner of it at the surface that's still going down under Oregon and Washington. Some of you may have read a New Yorker article about the potential for a big earthquake along Oregon and Washington. Um, this is the plate responsible. It was subducting under the entire west coast of the United States, not just Oregon and Washington, for about 200 million years bringing with it little island arcs got smashed on and accreted onto the continent. And over 200 million years, there's a whole lot of that plate sitting there deep in the Earth's interior. What's interesting to us is that we can still see that, and we can see it with this much detail. And that's interesting in part because we're always wondering how well does the Earth remix itself, right? You have this process of convection. How well mixed is the Earth's interior? We're talking about how do planets evolve. That would be really nice to know. So the fact that we can still see that A, it hangs together for hundreds of millions of years, drooping into the mantle, but it doesn't do so perfectly. If you look closely, you can see there are kind of holes, it kind of breaks apart a bit, it bends, kind of a bit misshapen. And all of this, these are all sort of clues that we have on how these basic, basic pro processes work to develop a planet like ours today. Now, of course, we always want more. We want better resolution. Uh, this type of study tends to kind of have trouble at really shallow depths, that kind of thing. So, so what can we do to, to move on from this? What's the next step? Um, we kind of have to go back to this diagram here to talk about one of the other things to think about on these types of regional scale studies. So I mentioned that aperture is really important because that lets you have these deep crossing rates. The other part that's really important is how close are the stations together, right? So if you imagine that we have the same aperture, but we lost the station in the middle, right? So now we've doubled our station spacing. You get rid of the rays that come off of that station, 
you lose those crossing rings. And if you notice the difference between that, again, not only do you lose resolution in general, but you lose resolution shallower. So the closer your stations are together, the shallower the shallowest crossing rays are, right? So if you want to see shallow scale structures, you need your stations to be really close together. Um, and so what that means is, so more stations mean we can see shallower structures. It also means just in general, we have better resolution throughout the model. So you want as many stations as you can get over as big of an area as you can get. And at that point, pretty much everyone in the audience that's not a seismologist rolls their eyes and say, all you ever want is more and more and more. But uh, we do. We want it all. <laughs> uh, but we're not going to get it, though. I hear Mick Jagger singing in the background somewhere about can we get what you want. Um, but what you want will depend a lot on what your science target is. And that's where this facility comes into play. Uh, IRIS, as Rick mentioned, is the Incorporated Research Institutions for Seismology. PASCAL, because seismologists are famous for their acronyms, is the Portable Array Seismic Studies of the Continental Lithosphere. I'm not, the A kind of comes in from, from somewhere like in the back there. <laughs> don't, don't look at it too closely. Um, it's a facility in Socorro, New Mexico, at, at New Mexico Tech, uh, where they provide seismic equipment, portable seismic equipment, for any scientist to use, especially if you get funded by the National Science Foundation to do research. You can borrow equipment from this facility for free to do your experiment. That's great. That's really great. Um, there are a few institutions like Carnegie that have their own seismic equipment, but most places can't afford it. So. Um, back in the mid-80s, we had some very forward-thinking scientists in our community that put this together with funds from the National Science Foundation. Among them were people like Selwyn Sachs and David James, who were my predecessor, my colleagues here at Carnegie. And then uh, and some of them have unfortunately now gone on to retire and have fun in warmer climes. Um, but if we look at what these look like, so this is a this is a typical what we call portable seismo uh, seismometer. So uh, let's see. I need a I need a volunteer just quickly. Sir, I'm gonna come up and help me for, for a moment. Um, would you would you mind just 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 uh just here just hold on to that. Just yep. So so you can see that thing is um is that, how does that feel? Is that comfortable? You want to carry that up a carry that up a mountain? Yeah, it's kind of kind of hefty. So this thing is a seismometer. Um, it has three components in it. Um, one aspect would be, let me rotate this this way. There we go. So right inset here, you see this little inset thing here? There's a leveling bubble in that little inset so that you can get it perfectly level. And these, these feet here, they spin so they can be screwed in and out so that you can get it perfectly level. This, uh, there's a slot. Where is that? Oh, other side. Right here. Where did it go? <coughs> no. Oh, it's right there. There's a little slot there. You can put a rod in that points due east, not north, east. This made by the eccentric Swiss watchmaker that made the STS-1 as well. Um, so I, we could probably put that you want to hold on to it for the talk, you're welcome to. <laughs> it weighs about, what do you think that weighs? Eh, it's probably a little bit more than that, but it's pretty heavy. Um, not a ton of fun to carry around. Uh, oops, sorry. This one's not much better. And then there's all the equipment that goes with it. So in here we have a, the recorder that records the data, puts it on flashcards like you might have in your camera. You have a power regulator, you have a battery. This is a, a modem or a GPS unit. You can use those for timing. You can time it absolutely perfect so that every single station has the exact same timing. Um, and then you, you sort of string these things together like this. So you have, over here, you have some sort of a vault. That's what the seismometer goes into. And then you have a, a box like this. These are called action packers. They're made by Rubbermaid. They're very reasonably waterproof-ish plastic boxes that you can, you can put your electronics into and then your solar panel. And this is indeed fire hose. It's there to keep the cows from chewing on the cables. Um, <coughs> installing these things takes a lot of work. And now it's not, you don't have a backhoe. And this is not professionally done. So this is grad student labor. 
Um, so, so what do you do? So first you have to get to the site, and that's usually, that can be more or less exciting, depending on where you are. And as you can see here, you have these big blue barrels here in the back of the truck. So in this case, this was in Peru, that's what we had for a vault. So that's what our seismometer was going to go into. You can kind of imagine, you can only put a couple stations worth of equipment into a single vehicle, so you have a lot of vehicles. Um, then you have to dig a hole. I, I tell people that, you know, I got a PhD to learn how to dig holes. I'm very good at digging holes. Uh, so you dig a hole and you bury that entire 35-gallon drum. And usually we set it in about 150 pounds of concrete. So I got the sand mixture down. I know how to do that. I'd be a great contractor. And then you put your seismometer in there. Now, now the, the, the barrel is in the ground. It's flush with the ground. Right? And they're about this tall. And now you have to level and orient that thing. Now, if you recall where that leveling bubble was, it was inset into the size of the seismometer, right? So you have like a mirror and a flashlight in your teeth while you're looking at the leveling bubble trying to like spin the little wheels, right? Yeah. Um, so there, there are a lot of great pictures that I won't show you of people hanging in barrels trying to do that. Um, Eventually you seal that up. In this case, we instead of fire hose, we use PVC piping to protect the cables that came out of it to keep the whole system waterproof. Uh, solar panels. Solar panels in foreign countries, especially third world countries, tend to grow legs like nobody's business. Uh, without them, the system doesn't work, so we tend to put them places where we hope people would be more reluctant to try and get to, so in this case on somebody's roof. Uh, and then ultimately you try and cable it all together and keep it running wherever it is that you are and then seal it up and leave it running. And typically we go back about every six months and we let them run for two years. Okay, you might imagine there's some challenges. So um, what counts for a road in some places is um, somewhat subjective. Uh, you also don't necessarily get to pick the rental vehicle that you get along the way. Returning them is sometimes challenging. Um, this particular hillside we'd already been warned was, was riddled with, with snakes, so we were macheting our way up and then ended up finding that there was too much water so we couldn't put a station there. Security, like I said, solar panels are an issue. This was in Peru, there was a helicopter pad on this guy's front lawn, which we thought was sort of curious. We were sort of wondering who exactly was flying in and out of there. Um, uh, in some of these communities, the communities are very well organized, so you go to community meetings. Uh, to meet with them, to discuss what it is that you're doing, to explain that you don't work for the oil company, to really that the oil company can't use your data or they can look at it, but it won't be of any use to them, that kind of thing. Then just digging, right? You, you typically want it to be on something relatively solid, but not so solid that you can't bury the barrel, right? So there's a lot of, a lot of trick in, in digging these holes. Um, this particular site here, we pretty much chipped out of something pretty close to rock all the way down. Um, water, if you want to make cement, you need water and more than just your average water bottles worth. Uh, in a lot of places that are dry, that's a challenge. Uh, and then customs. This equipment is expensive and you want to temporarily import that into a foreign country and they want money guaranteeing that you're not going to leave it there or sell it. Uh, and so often we have local collaborators that pretty much have to sign away their firstborn to let us have this equipment in the country. That also means all the equipment has to leave at the same time. So if any of it's stolen, whatever, you have to get all the documentation down or you're in big trouble. So these are sort of challenges. So you really have to get it right. So needless to say, it's a lot of work. So we choose our targets carefully, right? Our targets and our station design take a lot of thought to make sure that it's actually worth all of that effort. Okay. Uh, for me, one of the most interesting things, areas to study, though, is these subduction zones, so where these plates go down. Subduction zones, if we go back to our planet as living beast or living thing analogy, a subduction zone is kind of like the planetary lungs. It's where water and other volatiles are taken in to the planet, they're absorbed into the planet, they interact with the other materials in that planet and evolve them grow them, and then they're released, exhaled back out to the surface via volcanoes. Right? So this is very metaphorical, and I can see every scientist I know cringing slightly, but like, it's not actually that far off from the truth. So um, 
just a little bit of subduction zone 101, the water that goes into subduction zones goes into them via the sinking oceanic plate. So the oceanic plate is obviously sitting under an ocean uh, for often tens to hundreds of millions of years. And some of that water gets into the plate itself when the plate is first formed. But a lot of it gets into it because you bend the plate to get it to go down. When you bend it, it kind of cracks, right? And those cracks, water can get deep, deep into those cracks, through often the oceanic crust, into the oceanic mantle. Um, and it forms what we call hydrospaces. So this is, the water doesn't just stay there in pore spaces, little bubbles of water. It gets incorporated into the rock structure itself. These are crystals that have water built into them as part of their structure, right? <coughs> and then when this plate goes down, the, the free water that's in the sediments, whatever, that gets, the pressures get go high very quickly. So that just gets squeezed right back out of the trench. But, but the water that's in these crystals themselves, that sticks around for a while until the, the temperatures and the pressures in this plate go up enough that those crystals are no longer stable and they break down. They break down and form more dense crystalline lattices. And in that breakdown, they release that water. Now remember, the water is in these fault planes, right? So you, you put a bunch of, all of a sudden, this water gets released, it's in these fault planes, and what can happen is that you generate earthquakes down, you know, 100, 200 kilometers depth, where normally you wouldn't get earthquakes in the Earth's mantle. So you get these earthquakes, that water gets released, and it makes it out of these faults, it goes into this wedge of mantle material that's above the plate that we creatively call the mantle wedge. Um, <laughs> and water is very interesting because when it interacts with hot rock, it, it lowers the melting temperature. So the, the rock starts to melt. And little bits of melt come off this rock, it collects, it moves its way up somehow magically through this rock and comes out the surface as volcanoes. It takes along with it, takes the water with it, and it returns it to the surface. Um, and that's why you get these lines of volcanoes along places where you have subduction going on. Um, there are a lot of interesting questions. One of them is, so, so water goes in, water comes out, but what is that budget? How much water goes in, how much water comes out, and how much water keeps going past this system and is returned into the deep <coughs> interior of the Earth? Um, again, from a planetary evolution perspective, this is an important question. Are we draining our oceans into the center of the planet? It's been four and a half billion years. I think we're safe. You know, it's not like you're going to pull a cork out of a tub and end up in the oceans. But, but, it's, but it is an intriguing question. And actually, we've had some really interesting clues about this recently. Um, Grant Pearson and others in Alberta, they found a diamond. It's erupted to the surface. And that diamond, when it formed, it formed somewhere between 400 and 600 kilometers depth, and it formed around a little hunk of the rock it was in. So it encapsulated, it has this little enclosure that has a rock that has everything in it that's in the condition it was in when that diamond formed around it. It's perfectly preserved inside this diamond. It's tiny. So they looked at this, what we call inclusion, and they found there was water in there. There was a lot of water in there compared to how much rock there was in there. And if you extrapolate from this tiny, tiny little inclusion to the entire layer of the mantle that we're talking about here, just, you know, okay, you know, fair enough. It turns out there would be multiple oceans worth of water trapped inside the planet. Right? It's fascinating. How, when did that get, how did that get there? Does any of that water make it back up to the surface? We don't know. It's the only inclusion of its kind that we found that came from that deep down. Uh, but it certainly is sort of an eyebrow raiser, if that's correct. Uh, so that's sort of one of the things we want to know. The other, the other thing that subduction zones uh, pose as questions has to do with the, with the partial melting that I told you about. So when you add that water to that wedge of mantle, the mantle wedge, uh, and it forms a little bit of melt. Um, I like to call this part of the whole system the continental distillery because it works pretty much the same way as a still does. So if you're trying to make a hard alcohol, you take a not so hard alcohol, like a wine, and you heat it, right? Alcohol has a lower boiling temperature than water. And so as you heat it, the first thing that comes off is the alcohol. If you capture that vapor, you're left with something that's not pure alcohol the first time around, 
but it's a lot more alcohol. What you leave behind is mostly the water and all the other tasty stuff. So um, you repeat that often enough, and you end up with something that's pretty much pure alcohol, that's you know an Everclear. In the earth, it's the same idea, except instead of alcohol, we're talking about silica. The silica is the first thing to melt in these situations. And when the silica melts out, any element that's that's stuck in the crystal structure that doesn't really want to be there because it doesn't really fit in. So the really big elements, the stuff at the bottom of the, the table of elements, the radioactive elements, they don't fit into the crystal real well. They're uncomfortable. So as soon as a little bit of melt goes, they're like, Ooh, we're going to go over there. right? So these are called incompatible elements. They jump into the melt. The water jumps into the melt. And then that stuff moves its way to the surface, and it forms continental crust. OK. Um, that means that the composition of the continental crust is different from the composition of the rock it left behind, right? And I told you about how, as the Earth has been evolving over four and a half billion years, the dense stuff like iron ended up in the middle and the light stuff like silica ended up at the top. So this is in many ways the end stage of this evolution of the Earth, right? This is the, the, the fine stilling, that last little bit where we get this reserve of silica-rich rocks at the surface. That's important to us because it's what makes continents last as long as they do. Oceanic crust comes and goes. The old sh oldest oceanic crust on the planet is, you know, 100, 100, 200 million years old, something on that scale. The oldest continental rock that we know of, or parts of continental rock, are on the order of 4.4 billion years. These things have stayed at the surface, unmelted, for almost the entire life of the planet. And of course, if you want to have us walking around on a continent, you need the continent. So how is it that these continents form, right? And that is what happens at subduction zones. OK, so that was a really long way of saying, that's why I like studying these areas. Uh, if you're going to study a subduction zone where you have an oceanic plate going under a continent, South America is the place to be. It's sort of the, the, the archetypical ocean continent subduction zone that you might learn about. Uh, it's the Pacific Ocean, but the plate underneath it in this area is called the Nazca Plate. The Nazca Plate sinks under the South American continent, and it gives you the Andes Mountains. Okay, But this diagram, as nice as it is, is a little oversimplified. You see, here's this plate, and it just goes kind of straight down. Right? But it turns out South America is not that straightforward. This is a simple diagram that shows a couple of things. The little triangles here are volcanoes that are active in the geologically recent past. And you can see that there are some up here, there's some sort of in the middle, there's some down here. There's like a gap right here and here. These lines are contours to the top of the oceanic plate that's subducting under South America. And what you can see is that you have these these, uh, these excursions here, these places where the, the plate goes down to like 100 kilometers depth up in Colombia and Peru and in Chile, uh, and then it, it kind of shoals and then flattens out and travels horizontally for hundreds of kilometers before it turns the corner and keeps going deep into the mantle. Um, we think that that's probably caused because the oceanic plate that's sinking in some places has crust that's extra thick, so it's extra buoyant, so maybe it gets to some depth and it just doesn't want to sink for a while until it goes through some phase transitions and becomes more dense and can actually sink further. That's a topic of ongoing research. Um, but what we do know is that when you have these types of places, you end up with no volcanoes. Um, the no volcano thing's probably not that surprising because if you have this flat slab here, like you see in this upper diagram, the mantle wedge, this thing here, is pinched out to the far end. The mantle, remember, the mantle is solid. We talk about it moving, but it's actually very, it's a solid, it's very, very, very viscous. So it can't kind of creep in here above this, this flat part of the plate. And what that means is that the really hot temperatures associated with your typical mantle material are way out over here as opposed to being closer. And so if the water from these things, if that's released along this stretch, you can release as much water as you want. It's too cold. Even with the lowering of the melting temperature, it's still too cold to form melt. 
So you don't get any volcanoes in these situations. Okay, that's interesting. Um, but what might that tell us then about where water comes off and at what rate? The water here is trapped. It can't make it to the surface via the volcano. It's also not going to end up in the rest of the mantle. Nothing's moving here. So maybe we could study these places to see where water ends up and how it moves through this system. So there have been a lot of data collected from these flat slab regions over the last 15 years or so. My PhD work was down here in Chile and Argentina. That's a talk for another day. I did some recent research uh, starting in 2010. We had stations out in Peru and in Bolivia, these blue dots and these red dots here, uh, to study uh, the flat slab in this area. And so here's what that looks like in 3D to give you a better idea of what that bench-like structure might look like. So this is what the Peruvian flat slab uh, looks like, or at least what we thought it looked like. The dots up here, these are all the different stations we had. They're also here down here. There's sort of also dots on here. So you can kind of see what we were trying to do in terms of being able to image what this thing looks like and what it's going through while it's flat and then why it turns that corner. Um, we did an imaging study again, kind of like you did with all these other studies. So we've got red eye and blue eye. They mean the same thing they did before. Um, and so we have one cross section up here, one here, and one down here. So these upper two ones are what we would call flat slab cross sections, and the southern one here goes through the normal part of the plate, where it dips normally, where you have a normal volcanic arc above it. Right? So let's start with the bottom one. This is the one that should be easy. Right? So here, these are active volcanoes right there. These are earthquakes, these black dots here. Those are independently located from this study. So you notice they line up very nicely with this streak of blue eye here. That's probably the downgoing oceanic plate. And then above it, you have this blob of red eye. Again, remember, red means that it's not rigid. It's probably partially molten and or it has water in it. And that's totally consistent with what we expect in a subduction zone, right? Water comes off, it fluxes melt, it comes out the volcano. Okay, so that makes total sense. This one up here is the flat slab, right? So we have our blue eye here, but it kind of just doesn't want to sink. It goes all the way over to here and then goes down. We have some trouble imaging it here in part because we don't have stations in the ocean. So we can't, we kind of lose that last little bit out to the west. Uh, and then there's this really, really slow stuff underneath it that I'll get back to in a little bit, but just keep that in mind. But so we can, we can clearly see this thing flat and then all the way over. It's shallower than we thought it would be. Uh, it's right below the, the crust, the continental crust. But, uh, but basically, it's kind of where we, what, doing what we thought it would do. Then there's this northern one, right? Remember, this is supposed to be also right across that bench. It's not quite as long of a transect because we couldn't get this far into the jungle to put stations there. But if you just saw this, and you were asked to say, does this look like this? Or does this look like this? Which one would you pick? How many, would, how many people would pick C? All right. Thank you for humoring me. It looks more like C, right? It looks like you've got a dipping thing of blue eye, you've got a dipping thing of red eye, but we don't have any volcanoes. What we do have is this one lone measurement of heat flow. Heat flow is a way of just seeing how much heat is actually coming out of the crust. And for the most of the flat slab, heat flow is really, really low, like five times lower than a normal continent and even lower than that from a normal volcanic area. Except for this one spot, they happened to take a measurement right there, this crazy high heat flow measurement, and they blew it off as like, oops, guess we screwed that one up. <laughs> and that was like 20 years ago and nobody's gone back. So we're looking at that and wondering, huh, how did that happen? So we went and we mapped out what the geometry of this plate must look like in 3D. And we came up with this. So this is what we thought we were going to find. And this is what we actually found. So it's much shallower, but sort of in a finger-like geometry, right where that ridge is going in. Remember, we thought maybe the ridges were involved. And then to the north, the plate is clearly torn. It's clearly torn. Um, and so that's interesting. It goes along with that previous image we saw from the Earthscope science that sort of said, oh, these plates, they break up and stuff as they go down. But we thought that happened deeper. But that can happen that shallow is a little bit surprising. Um, the other thing that we noticed, though, and this comes back to this funny thing here, 
this, this, this blob of red eye under the flat slab. So underneath the plate, how do you get something to be red? Right? Remember we said red was hot, or it was melted, or it was uh, wet. But, it's, but you don't see that over here, and you don't see that under these other plates. So it's a really interesting question. How do you get that? There are a lot of possible explanations for this, and we haven't decided on one. But I'd like to put one out there that's perhaps a bit tantalizing, which is what if this tear here, if the rocks from above this tear are flowing to underneath the plate over here and bringing with it the water that's coming off this part of the plate, right? So what if, this is now looking from north to south, this is our tear, this was normal, the normal looking subduction zone now, right? It's producing water, we haven't quite gotten the volcano out of it yet, but you know, give it another million years. Um, what if those mantle rocks are moving down through this tear, bringing water from above the plate to the back side of the plate? Well, that's intriguing, especially because you know, when we were talking about the water budget here and how much of it goes down, how much of it comes out the volcano, how, of it, how much of it might go deeper into the thing, we did not count for like, hey, how much of it slips around the back side of the plate and just hangs out in the mantle there, right? That's not usually part of the math that we're thinking about, but in some places, maybe we really should. And the more we map out these downgoing plates, the more we realize that these structures are really heterogeneous. heterogeneous. They break up, they do all kinds of crazy stuff. I'm clearly running long, but nobody seems to be running out of the room, so I'll keep going. Um, so future direction. So this is a great image. We've learned a lot, but we'd really like to do better, and we can. So this is an image that was produced back in 2002. The data set was actually collected in the 90s. But it's a different type of imaging than what we've used that lets you get much higher resolution images of these things. So normally here, you know, you can see the plate, but you're certainly not looking at the oceanic crust. You see the whole plate going down as a packet, right? 100 kilometers worth of it. Here, this is in Cascadia. This little streak of red eye here, that's the oceanic crust. And the blue underneath it is the oceanic mantle. Those are both part of the plate. They're both rigid and they're both going down. And that crust at some point goes through that phase change, the one that where it releases the water and becomes more dense. And then it basically starts to look like the stuff underneath it. So it becomes less slow, and it kind of disappears. So this is what we call basaltic crust. This is eclogitized crust. When it goes from basalt to eclogite, it releases water. What's interesting about that is that this little wedge here <coughs> has an interesting property. This stuff up here is the crust. And normally, the crust, you see it's red over blue. That means it's slower material over faster material. That's what we expect in the crust. But here, that's inverted. You have blue over red. Only way you get that is if there's a ton of water sitting right underneath the crust. That makes sense. If this crust here is dehydrating right here, dumping its water into it, then you should get a whole lot of water right here, right? Images like this give us precise details of where exactly is this water coming off. So look at this scale. This only goes to 120 kilometers depth. So we can see the very shallow stuff about less than 10 kilometers depth, kind of hard to see, but everything from 10 to 120, we get this really nice crisp image of exactly what is going on. So why aren't we doing more of this? Well, look at the top. You see these little triangles here? You can barely tell they're triangles. It looked like a zigzag line. Each one of those is a seismic station. This deployment had five kilometer station spacing in a line across the Cascades. It's a Herculean effort that has not been repeated. For somewhat obvious reasons, it's a lot of work. Um, and in some places, that's just not feasible, depending on the logistics. Um, but what we would like to do is do more of this without actually killing our grad students in the, possible, in, in the process. And, and Right now, it's just too hard, but there are technological advances that are coming forth that will make this possible. So specifically, there are new sensors that are much smaller. So I brought one, so you remember my other guy. So this guy here, this is the new version of that. 
right? So that's, if you, if you would like to, to see, I think you probably would rather carry that up the mountain than that other guy, right? The other thing that's nice about this is that you can put this directly in the dirt. You don't need to build a vault. You don't need to pour concrete. You don't need a barrel. You just dig a hole a couple feet deep. You stick this in the ground. You orient it and level it, and you walk away. And the ancillary equipment, the stuff that we used to have in that great big action packer, and then a separate solar panel, that now all fits in this box. And the solar panel, as you can see up there, this box is that box, just fits right on top. So instead of taking four people a day with two trips, because the concrete has to cure, to install a station, it'd take two people about an hour to put one of these in. So then, with that, you can really do something, right? Because you can actually start putting out lots of stations. And so I'm going to kind of hurry up here, but one interesting place to study might be a place like this flat slab up here in Columbia. It kind of looks like this. These earthquakes here show you how far east that flat slab goes. Uh, and this is sort of just a, these are all different papers that have come up with other various creative diagrams as to what the geometry of the plates are. Because there's some people who think that this here is from the Caribbean plate and that this here is just sort of stopping right there. I don't actually think that's the case. I actually think that this Nazca plate is responsible for those earthquakes way in there. The Caribbean plate isn't going very far. We can test that. If we had the ability to put out, let's say, 200 or 300 of these things without killing our grad students, you could put out really dense transects alone here, right? And if this thing forms eclogite from east to west, then we know it's this plate, right? Because in that case, the north to south line would look the same all along the strip because it's all the same plate going down, the same age, the same temperature. If you find the opposite pattern, well, then you know it's the Caribbean plate that's going down. So these very basic plate tectonic questions that we can begin to get at, in addition to these bigger questions about how our planet evolves. So we're moving in that direction. We're really excited about it. Um, and so hopefully uh, in the near future, you'll see me, uh, peace process willing, in Colombia collecting these data sets. Uh, and with that, uh, I'll just do a quick summary in images. So yes, we can see inside the planet. Uh, we care a lot about aperture and resolution, so we want as many stations as we can get. Increasingly, we are not going to have to make these trade-off decisions as technology improves. And so eventually, we'll actually be able to get the answers that we need to look at these important problems. Thank you. See why, our, why Lara was uh, uh, taken as the uh, distinguished lecturer of, the, of IRIS. So it was a very, very, uh, very uh, enjoyable presentation. We'll take some questions if there are any. Yeah, I, I'm wondering about the heterogeneity of the mantle. Mm -hmm. is, is it primal or is it being created by the plate tectonic activity? That's a good question. I think we think some of that, most of that differentiation is happening whether it's plate tectonics or just the early differentiation process is a good question. It kind of depends on what you call plate tectonics. There was something that was happening four billion years ago to create continents, but whether we had this sort of organized system that we sort of think of today as plate tectonics is a little bit difficult to understand. So I think, or are you asking like, is are those different blobs like a hunk of the rock that came, like a separate? No, I'm asking whether I think we're thinking it was created. So, oh, so the question, I'm sorry, the question was the heterogeneities that we see in the mantle, did those happen when the planet formed from everything smashing together, or did those come about because of the segregation process? And it's the latter. When, when all these things smashed together, the whole thing was molten, right? And you had some early segregation of the core, so that happened gradually as this was forming, but you aren't probably keeping these individual bits of of, of, of accreted material together at that time. So it, it's an evolved feature. In addition to looking at the velocity differences, 
Can you also detect attenuation? Is the hotter a rock also going to uh, be less effective at transmitting the waves? Can you, and can you learn anything more than just what you learn with velocity differences? Yes. So um, you can learn a lot from attenuation. Uh, that certainly also has big hazards implications. So like the Virginia earthquake shook and damaged places far further away from the epicenter than a, an earthquake of that size would have done in, let's say, California. Attenuation studies are difficult. The measurements themselves are far more difficult to make than the measurements that we make for this type of study. Um, in grad school, the, the saying was, so attenuation is known as Q, the parameter is Q. So the, the saying was, friends don't let friends do Q. <laughs> uh, that said, um, even though it's difficult, people do look at attenuation precisely because it gives you information you don't get from velocity different physical properties that are affected differently depending on whether it's melt or water or temperature. So we do our best, but it's tricky. So no breakthroughs yet. Well, we, we've learned a lot from attenuation, but, but it's not going to give you better resolution than the velocity measurements will. There's a question way in the back there. How do you go about measuring the time scale? Time scale of the dynamics. In other words, you said it takes 200 million years for this, 300 million years for this, and so forth. Um, we seismologists leave timing by and large to the geochemists. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, that's actually a really good point, though. So, so seismology tells you what is there today, right? Um, so you can do a couple of things. I mean, you can you can look at how fast are the plates moving. So if you have 100 kilometers of slab, and you know the rate with which they're converging, you can kind of back out how long it took to get there. But that only works for the time frames over which you think things have been moving at the same rate, and plate motions change over time. Um, a lot of the timing is done with isotopes and with geochemistry. So we combine forces to try and put the whole story together. A lot of it, I, I, I can add some to that, is that uh, the original uh, plate tectonic velocities were determined by geology, by, by actually mapping and looking at you know, the rock that used to be here is now up there, and, and dating these and getting, getting uh, speeds from them, basically. And the stunning part about that, you know, these gave numbers of centimeters per year, uh, which is sort of typical plate motions, but the stunning part now is you can actually measure those with GPS. So they're precise enough to measure a centi you know, millimeters per year of movement. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that when you measure them with GPS now, you're getting very similar numbers to the geological numbers that are integrated over millions of years. Mm -hmm. So this, this, this aspect of, of movement is something that we're so <coughs> unused to seeing in our experience, but it's going on while we're standing on it. It's happening. It's not lurching. It's just moving slowly, and the Earth is doing plate tectonics you know, while, while we're sitting here docking. Um, two questions. Isn't uh, granite one of the building blocks for the continents, and, and that was something that grew up later? Um, uh, you know, not from the basalt of melting. And the other question, if I can remember, is um, is zirconium in, in Australia, does that provide a measure of how old the Earth is? Uh, is? Yes, so there were two questions. So, so the first was about granite. So granite is a very, very silica-rich rock. So it's, it's sort of the, the, the very, very, very distilled, ever-clear version of, of continental rock. Um, and so you don't get that. So the first time you, you melt it, you're not going to end up with a granite, right? So that you, you've got to go through that distillation process repeatedly to end up with a granite. Um, in terms of the zircon, uh, yes, so there are, there are zircon crystals. Zircons are, are a particular type of crystal that we can use to get dates, the ages at which those crystals formed and since which they have not been remolten. And so the oldest zircon crystals that we have are on the order of about 4.4 billion. 4.37. What? 4.37. 4.37 billion years old. So, um, you know, when the Earth is 4.5 billion years old, the Moon probably formed about 4.45 million years ago. So that gives you an idea of when the first crystals formed that are preserved to this day without having been remolten along the way. Question here. 
Um, have you been able to gather any data uh, in Oklahoma uh, with the occurrence of all these earthquakes uh, to use in developing your, your science? So, yes. Um, I actually was part of a project this summer where we went out and put out a bunch of, of seismometers. Very different from this type of equipment. They're high frequency sensors because we're, we're studying these very local, very comparatively speaking, small events. Uh, and we're putting the stations basically right on top of them. Uh, so, so we did do that this summer. I personally don't study that phenomena. I don't study the earthquakes per se. I spend a lot of time just mapping out these 3D structures. Um, but there are a lot of people who are looking into that um, and looking into how they form and then what we might have as a practical solution. Is there some way um, uh, to make sure that, that people stay safe? What's the question? Oh, the question was Oklahoma. So are we, am I, or are people in general collecting data in Oklahoma to study the uptick in seismicity there? And the answer is yes. I'm very interested in uh, Sierra Nevada. I understand that's where the Earth's crust is the thinnest, mm -hmm. and that uh, um, miners would break through a wall and find that steam was flowing over them uh, deep inside the mountains there. Is there. Are there any other places like that, or is it unique? Arguably, everybody, everywhere on the planet is unique. It's, it's amazing how, <laughs> how heterogeneous the Earth is. Um, for a mountain belt, the Sierra Nevada's crust is thin. It's not the thinnest crust on the planet. Um, it's not the thinnest continental crust on the planet. Um, but the heat flow itself, so that, okay, so for scale, the continental crust is on average about 35 kilometers thick. Under the Sierra Nevada, it's probably about that, maybe 40, 40 kilometers. For a mountain belt that size, you might expect uh, the crust to be substantially thicker than that. It's sort of an iceberg effect. You have a little bit of mountain at the top, you have to have a really big root underneath. Um, so that's sort of where it's, it's surprising. Um, the crustal thickness in the Sierra Nevada are surprising. Um, the mine shafts that you were probably talking about probably did not go more than a kilometer or two into that 40 kilometer crustal thickness. So we're, we're, they're not blowing into the mantle. The heat, though, that's coming through could come from any number of sources. Um, if nothing else, the crust in general tends to be really hot because, remember the distillation process, I said all the big elements like to jump into the melt, well that includes the radioactive elements. So for those of you who have radon testing, that's why. So that radioactive heat does tend to build up, it does tend to increase that the heat gradient as you go down, goes up pretty fast. So if there's a hydrothermal circulation going on, if that water goes down deep, this is where geothermal, this is how geothermal works. The water goes down deep, it picks up that heat from the crust as it heats up quickly and then brings it back up. So if there's that kind of circulation going on, you can see them finding themselves in trouble. There was a TED talk uh, within the last year or so about a river that's for about 10 kilometers in the northern part of South America that's bo boiling. And I'm wondering if that's anywhere near the area that you'll be studying and whether you're uh, curious about it, have it's, ideas. It's funny, you should ask. So he's asking about a TED talk about a boiling river in Peru. Rick's kind of chuckling. Um, yes, there's a boiling river in Peru. And yes, it is very interesting. And it is just north of the area I was showing you about. And it is related to the flat slab. It is at the eastern edge of where we think the flat slab extension would be. So if you took that original model of where the flat slab is, it was plot sort of just on the eastern edge of where that thing starts to go back down again. We of course know now that the flat slab is probably all broken up. Uh, but we don't know what it looks like that far north because we don't have any stations there. Um, there is, however, a really intriguing cluster of earthquakes at about the depth that the flat slab should be right there. There are no other earthquakes anywhere near it, but there's this one little vertical column about 50 kilometers high with a ton of earthquakes, and it's sitting right underneath the boiling river. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I haven't quite decided what to do about that just yet. <laughs> but we're thinking about it, yeah. There was a question over here. Uh, what, what is the chemistry of, um, of this whole situation? I've 
really don't know much about this at all, but basalt, you said converts into, once it goes down deep enough, it converts into eclogite. Eclogite. Now, do we know what eclogite looks like? Have you ever mm -hmm. seen it? Yeah, and in fact, you probably have. Eclogite, actually my mother has a countertop made of eclogite. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a combination of clinoperoxine, which is sort of a green looking rock, uh, and garnet. Red. So if you see a countertop that's sort of like green and red, that's probably eclogite. Um, <laughs> yeah, my mom got the counter. I was like, "Hey, did you know?" <laughs> she was like, "Why? What are you talking?" Does it eventually come back up, and that's why we the eclogite? Eclogite is really <coughs> dense, so coming up is not something that it really likes to do. We do, however, okay, so. Um, we do occasionally see things that are exhumed that are brought back up through other tectonic processes. So you do see eclogite making it to the surface. Eclogite also sometimes forms at the roots of mountains. So if the mountains are down there uh, for long enough, the, the thick crust, uh, crustal root under a mountain will eventually turn into eclogite. And then if that mountain kind of gets eroded away, that eclogite can make it up to the surface. So there are a bunch of different ways we, can, we actually do get hand samples of eclogite. I was just curious from a sensor perspective, how um, crucial is it that you get those things in level, and is there a sensor to tell you that it's not level, that just so happens to be for some reason? Which? So the question was, how important is it that the sensors are perfectly level, and is there some sort of mechanism where it can tell us if it goes out of level for some reason? The answer is, it's incredibly important that they're perfectly level. Uh, the newer ones are less sensitive. So actually, one of the specs that you can get is called tilt tolerance. So, so how far off of level can the thing be and still 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 give you good data? Well, so in the in the old ones, right, we, we had a concrete pier. So when you when you pour that concrete, it's liquid, and that kind of auto levels. Li liquid's really good at leveling itself. And then... And then you have a leveling bubble, right? In the case of that big green thing, it's inconveniently inset into the side. On the other one, it's actually right on the, well, actually it isn't, but they, but they make them with leveling bubbles right on top, so you can just see. It's basically locally level. It has to be level. That's to right. It has to be locally level. Um, yeah, no, you actually have to put your own, you have to put your own leveling bubble on it. No, but you do still have to level it, so you have to put your own leveling bubble on it. The reason they don't have the leveling bubble on this particular one, you'll notice this thing looks pretty pretty chunky, uh, and that's because it was designed to be direct buried, so it was designed to be stuck right, right in the dirt and get buried, and these leveling bubbles tend to be kind of the Achilles heels of these sensors. They break, they're made of plastic. So they just sort of decided, uh, the manufacturer decided to just not even bother, just buy a cheap one in a hardware store, stick it on the top, and then level your sensor. Um, with these guys, because we don't have concrete under them, we actually usually put them in playground sand and then tamp them in. And as we're tamping them in, keep a good idea that it stays oriented north-south and that it's, it's a little tricky. Uh, so you can tell if you use the data? You can, usually because your data go to hell. <laughs> um, so so the, the way that it works is you have these, you have these masses and the masses stay perfectly still because of inertia, right? An object at rest remains at rest. Um, and what you measure is there's these little plates on either side that are magnetic. And, and what you're we're trying to figure out is how much current do you have to put through those mates to force the mass to move with the rest of the sensor when the ground moves. And so if your sensor goes out of whack, now all of a sudden the mass is leaning up against one of the plates and you get nothing, right? So it doesn't have to be, there's perfect, there's good enough, and there's that. We record what the mass position is between those plates as a function of time. So we can plot out exactly when, if it goes out of center, we can plot out exactly when that happens. Um, the masses are also on really delicate pivots, so the pivots used to break. The new ones, though, they're much more robust. They can tolerate more tilt, and they don't break as often. So, so far, then, you just don't get you're, Yeah, you're just not going to get data from that sensor for that time. OK, we'll take two more questions. Yeah. How do you find them if you bury them in the dirt by GPS or even a flag? That is an excellent question. Uh, for the stuff that I do, you can bury everything except the solar panel. You bury the solar panel, 
<laughs> I, I've been tempted because they, they get stolen so often. It's like, I can't we just bury that as well? They don't work very well when you do that. So, um, so that's usually our clue as to where those are. You do have something at the surface. For the newer, for some of the high frequency stuff, like the stuff we installed in Oklahoma, for those, you don't need a solar panel. They run off D-cell batteries for a month. So you can just stick them in the ground and leave them. And those, you're actually out there with like a, a, one of those like wavy things you have on the beach, like uh, looking for magnetic, for the, the yeah, looking for the thing. Um, that's a lot less fun, but but it works. I don't, I don't do that for the most part, though. I usually have the, the great big blue flag. We did this in the Western U.S. where we play these, and I, I got smart and decided to take photographs of every installation so I could find them again, just mm -hmm. like that. And I ended up with, with 50 photographs of a little piece of sagebrush and, and dirt. <laughs> <laughs> after, yes. after the fact, I figured it wasn't the most effective. Okay, so last, last question over here. Uh, just a simple question. Uh, is there any way we can have access to some of your slides? Or is that like only yours and we can't have any of them? No, yeah. You which, yeah, sure. Um, the, so the talk will be up on uh, the, it's being filmed, so it'll be up on our YouTube page. So that's the one way to get them. Uh, it's up to Laura whether yeah. she wants to provide slides. I mean, slides, if there's so anything in particular you want, just come up and let me know or send me an email and I'm happy to share. There's nothing in here that's proprietary. So, so we'll call it quits at that. Uh, the next uh, lecture is November 15th. It's given by Bob Hayes in the Geophysical Laboratory. It's on the private lives of minerals, and, and I hope that it's a G-rated uh, <laughs> audience. It's a loud talk. But uh, let's thank Laura.